What if you had a guide who could tell you how to bridge a gap between who you are today and who you're destined to be? What if each week you could hear a story of someone who has tried and succeeded, or perhaps tried and failed, but learned something in the process? Limitless Spirit is a weekly podcast where host Helen Todd interviews guests about topics and personal stories on defining life's purpose, pursuing personal growth, and developing a deeper faith in Christ. Only about 24% of Christians that attend church regularly still believe that the Bible is the inerrant, authoritative Word of God. So about 76% of the church believe the Bible is something less than God-breathed. First time ever in history we've been at that level. It's something like 37% of pastors is all that's left of pastors who teach a Christian worldview in America. We, we need to do what we can to really you know, preserve our core here in America for a biblical worldview and also around the, uh, around the world. Has the Christian church in America been hijacked by politics? There are fewer church-going Christians today who believe that the Bible is the authoritative word of God. And recently, we've seen a dramatic increase in liberal theology in churches around the country. Welcome to the Limitless Spirit podcast. I'm your host, Helen Todd. My guest on this episode is Lucas Miles, a pastor, author, podcaster, and an activist for a free state and the free people. We talk specifically about his latest book, The Christian Left, How Liberal Thought Has Hijacked the Church. This book examines the effect of liberal theology in churches around America. In our conversation, we discuss the church's role in influencing the state. Lucas defines the term Christian left, and we talk about how to address these issues without the church becoming a pawn in the political system. Good morning, Pastor Lucas Miles. It's wonderful to have you on the Limitless Spirit podcast. How are you today? Hey, I'm doing great. It's good to be with you. I'm excited to talk to you today about your book, specifically Christian Left, How Liberal Thought Hijacked the Church. And the main reason I wanted to have this conversation is because sometimes it feels like politics hijacked the church in America on both the right and the left. And I think it's an important topic. Um, But let's start first with what inspired you to write this book. You are a pastor, you are a podcaster, you are a filmmaker. What comes first? Do you consider yourself a political activist as well? Uh, I think I'm an activist for a, a free state and a free people. If that makes me a political activist, then I guess I'm a political activist. But I, I, I really believe that biblical principles should guide our lives. And I think that, uh, um, you know, I, I see I see tyrannical tendencies by our current administration and by by uh, a rise of Marxism and in, in really the world. And that's something I think should should worry all of us and should get all of us involved to make sure that that doesn't happen. So, uh, you know, I certainly stay very active in in politics. I um, very rarely will I endorse a candidate. I did hear just recently a uh, local uh, candidate that uh, uh, that I know well. Um, but uh, for the most part, I'm here to, you know, really help provide uh, maybe reminder about who we are as people of God and and the, the principles this nation was founded upon. I think this is specifically interesting because you're not – just a regular church member. You are a pastor. You are a Christian leader. So, what comes first in your life? Your calling as a pastor, or your passion for a free society and free people? Yeah, look, I mean, it, absolutely. Our faith has to shape our politic, and not the other way around. The moment that politics starts shaping faith, that's a problem. the The passions that I have for this nation, for uh, for people, you know, uh, to experience those, all of that is based upon the principles that I see in the word. And, and I think that, um, the church has to be a voice for, uh, reminding the state of the importance of these biblical principles, uh, and biblical values in order to keep the state from getting off track. I don't see that as politics. I see that as the church doing its job. Uh, I know that there's probably people that would call that politics, 
But I think when the church is doing its job, the state is reminded of the role that the state is, is supposed to fulfill. Because the state, if it's truly a good state, is doing what it's doing because it is uh, maintaining a privilege given to it by God. The state doesn't have any, you know, uh, power in and of itself. It has power because it's been uh, it has it, it's been given a sphere of sovereignty uh, by God to manage certain aspects of society. But the moment it oversteps its bounds, or the moment that it 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 uh, um, you know uh, gives up those duties, uh, either one of those is a problem. And I think that's where the, the the job of the people of God to come in and remind the state of its role. Let's talk about that when you say the church should influence the state. Are you talking about the church influencing the system or the church influencing individuals? Yeah, I, I think that, I mean, certainly to some degree, both. I mean, we as as Christians, Christians have an agenda. And that's something that I don't think is talked about enough. As a Christian, I have an agenda. And that is to see as many people saved as possible. I want to see people impacted and affected by the Lord Jesus Christ, to see their lives change, transform, fill, to see them, you know, exit a kingdom of darkness into a kingdom of light, to be able to experience the joy of eternity with Christ, you know, forever. And and I think that that is, that is a, it's not a hidden agenda. It's a very, it's a very straightforward agenda. This is our purpose. On this earth, our, our job as believers is to be me, uh, messengers of reconciliation, to, to minister to as many people as possible. And you know, to in, in to do our part in seeing that um, society is is a place where the 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 principles and precepts of God can thrive, and because we believe that God's way produces the best the best society imaginable, and so we don't do that by force, we don't do that by coercion, uh, we do that by um, uh, uh, you know really uh, um, imploring people you know, to, to, to listen, to fall, and by demonstrating in our own lives how these principles have transformed and changed us and bring, brought benefit to our lives. And so that's, so that we want that to impact the state as a system uh, or, or um, as a structure. We also want that to impact individuals, you know, within that structure. So I, I think it, in many ways, it's both. So how do we impact the state as a structure? So I think we impact the state as a structure by, you know, uh, look, there, there's there's always a fear that people have when um, Christians start talking about things that are that are, you know, referred to as political, because the argument that you'll hear is a lot of times is, well, or do you just want a theocracy? And the answer is, no, I don't want a theocracy. What I want is called a theonomy. Uh, a theocracy is essentially when the state and the church are operating as one and and basically the church is running the state and the state is running the church that's a problem that doesn't work history has proved that it doesn't have great results uh, a lot of corruption is, is is you know tends to ensue and you know but that's not what christians are calling for and it's it's a it's a misnomer to call it that i'm sure there's probably some christians that think that's what they want but they don't they don't know better the biblical model is what's called a theonomy. And a theonomy is essentially when godly principles are allowed to reign among the people, that those principles reach the highest levels of society and government in such a way that it impacts and shapes that society uh, and that that society becomes based upon these principles. It's not it doesn't put the church in a ruling position. It doesn't put the church in a governing position. It puts the church in a place of influence to where the ministry of the church has become so impactful that every corner of society has been impacted by it. And you see that uh, um, that you see that manifest in the policies that are made and in the the way in which people live and, and govern. And so that's a very different thing. That's not a state that is, uh, um, you know, forcing anything. It's not a state that's, you know, uh, manipulating or pulling the strings on anything. It's just a state that's shining the light of Christ in such a way that it, it's that people are taking note and they're changing as a result of it. From what you're saying, I understand we don't achieve this through the means of political process. We achieve this by being what we're supposed to be in Christ, which is te making disciples, teaching them about the doctrine of Christianity. Do I understand you correctly? I think it starts there. And so this is a, you know, the, the battle against the kingdom of darkness, we'll call it that, 
is is really fought at multiple levels. And so there is a spiritual component at the beginning that has to be in place. All the things that you just said. Um, And I think it's important that people recognize that politics is downstream of uh, culture. And ultimately, culture is downstream of the religious ethos that that a people are governed by. And so uh, we believe as as Christians that that, you know, somebody's faith drives their decision making in all these other aspects. So we, of course, want to impact that first and foremost. But we also recognize that not everybody shares the same worldview as us. So as citizens in this country, we thankfully have a right to use our voice as citizens in this country, not as the church, to um, to also impact people in that way. And so we can vote. We can get behind co- uh, candidates. We can lobby our our uh, um, you know policymakers to you know to uh, encourage them to support certain ideas. And so there's a lot of ways in which we can be involved. And I think what we're seeing right now is if if Christians don't use their voice regarding these political issues, then we might not, in the long run, have the freedoms to be able to use our voice for the spiritual issues. And so. You know, it, it goes both ways, and we have to affect it from and, and work it from both sides. But the heart of it is certainly the faith component. I, I think, in many ways, you know, you hear this term used a lot, and and so I'm kind of borrowing it from from probably people smarter than I. But it's uh, you you hear this term of building a secondary economy, and I think that that's something that's really key for uh, a free state and a free nation right now as tyranny spreads from our government into corporate America, uh, into, you know, various organizations and agencies and nonprofits, and and to some degree, even many Christian, you know, organizations and higher ed, et cetera. I think that that freedom loving people have to begin to create a secondary economy. And what that looks like is, you know, we want to, we still want to impact people. So as much as we can, as much as we're able to, we utilize the platforms that are available to us, whether that be in commerce or social media or uh, you know any given industry. But as we start seeing that we cannot be who God's called us to be on this, those existing structures, then we have to look at creating structures that still allow us to, to be those things that have not bowed down to a tyrannical state. So we see that in alternative social media. We see that by supporting local coffee shops over Starbucks or other, you know, uh, groups. We see that, you know, by using maybe local credit unions over Fortune 500 banks uh, that are going to support ESG and, and you know, other, other you know, uh, really Marxist endeavors. And so uh, I think that all of those things play a role in developing that sort of secondary economy. And I think the church, the cool thing about the church is you have in, in any given church, there's so many businesses represented, so many small business owners, all of these things that you get to support each other, you know, and, and uh, I think that uh, as, as often as I can, instead of just going the easy route, I want to say, is there anybody I know locally who can do this? Is there anybody who's a believer who does this business I can support? Is there anybody who's, you know, a, a conservative that I can put money into in this way rather than just, you know, kind of, you know, supporting some big corporation or supporting communist China through what I'm doing? And so uh, I think those are some practical things that we can do as, again, we're, we're also supporting and leading the spiritual side of this. Do you think there is a danger that this will deepen the divide that already exists in our society and further alienates us from each other? So, I mean, to some degree, that's a concern, but we're already being alienated, but it's by force. And so when I, I mean, I, I, I do a show on Epoch Times that I host. I just launched uh, here actually uh, uh, recently. It's called Church and State. And so one of the things I covered on the first episode was this, um, uh, you know, some of the attacks that have been happening against churches. And we live in a world where, say, a platform like Twitter allowed all sorts of posts after Roe v. Wade, after the dismantling of that. They allowed all sorts of posts from people saying that we should show up to churches with guns, that we should tear down churches, burn churches, destroy churches, that the churches are at fault. They allowed this rhetoric to to be on their platform, but yet you had other people that were posting about Bible verses or a biblical view of gender, you know, sexuality, marriage, et cetera, and they're deplatformed. And so, you know, you come to a point where you can't continue on that platform doing what you do, being who you are, 
especially as a nonprofit or as a Christian organization, without major you know, fallout. And so you come to a point where you have to start choosing some other outlets. I don't think that we need to totally, you know, uh, uh, build a fence around ourselves and live in a commune. That's not what I'm supporting, you know, by building a secondary economy. We still are going to interact in the world, uh, but we have to create opportunities for the message to get out, for voices to be heard, and, you know, where people can be supported. Uh, because, you know, if, if the U.S. goes in the direction of, say, communist China with social credit scores, then eventually, if somebody doesn't like your tweet or doesn't like your post on Facebook, they can also now decide that they're not going to lend you money for your next house or for your small business or whatever that is. And unless we have a parallel economy that's really set up to be able to help people in those positions, it's going to get to the point very quickly where um, we have a major economic crisis on our hands and social crisis on our hands, especially for God's people who are prevented from buying and selling as a result of a tyrannical government. And, and uh, I, I'm not trying to you know, say that we're living in, in times of the book of Revelation. Uh, I think we can certainly make a case we're closer today than we were yesterday. But, but this is just a result of tyranny. It's not the first time tyranny has happened in the world, but it is the first time that tyranny has been allowed to happen at this level uh, through so many players and with the use of technology we're seeing that on a scale that we've never seen before. And so if Christians don't get involved in the conversation and involved in the, uh, and I'm going to use this word very loosely, I don't mean this in a violent sort of way, but involved in the fight for freedom, uh, that, that uh, you know, we're going to find ourselves in a situation that none of us really want to be in. It's interesting because I grew up in the Soviet Union in the later years of the Soviet Union. The communist revolution happened long before I was born, And uh, obviously, I wasn't taught the truth in history classes there, as you can imagine. But later in life, I did a study, uh, a research on the role of the church in the communist revolution that took place in Russia in 1917, because the Orthodox Church uh, had tremendous spiritual authority in Russia. It was the only official church in the country. And had they spoken out against what was happening, things could have been very, very different in Russia. So you're right. Uh, the church has a responsibility. Yeah, if I, if I could jump in on that. I mean, we, we see the same thing that happened in, in Nazi Germany. So during the, during the, uh, the rise of the Third Reich, um, there was a, a prominent church in Germany, the, the German church, and many of them, they were they were divided on a couple things. You had the Bonhoeffers and and uh, Karl Barth and others that that were more um, outspoken against the Nazis. Um, but for the most part, you had Christians who were either silent, who knew it was wrong, but they were scared. They didn't want to dabble in it. Uh, they didn't know what to do. Uh, so it was it was kind of the group that you know uh, w- was singing louder as the trains were passing by with the people on them. You know, singing their hymns on a Sunday. Um, you you also had a group that bowed down to the to the Reich, and so that group was known as the Nazified German Church. Those individuals, you know, essentially what they did is they replaced the the Bible with Mein Kampf and the swast or the cross for the swastika, and they adopted the the rhetoric and the agenda of the Nazi state. And those churches are known uh, in history as Christian nationalists, and it's interesting because this is a term that is thrown out there a lot by the left regarding probably people like me who believe that uh, Christian values should be, you know, have a place within um, not only the marketplace, but also within politics and with uh, government and these things. And they will use the term Christian nationalist to talk about people that are patriotic or people that support, uh, you know, that that have a love for country, this sort of thing. Um, what we see in Nazi Germany is Christian nationalists actually were Christians who abandoned biblical principles in favor of the agenda of the state. And they promoted the tactics and the methodology and the messaging of Nazi Germany. That's not what we're seeing happen with Bible-believing Christians in America. What we're seeing happen with Bible-believing Christians in America is they're rejecting the agenda of the state. They're rejecting the values of leftism, Marxism, socialism, etc. And they are supporting biblical values over the values of government. 
Um, it's the exact opposite of what happened in Nazi Germany. And, and Christians today are thankfully being more and more outspoken about that in many, in many examples. Interesting enough, what we're seeing among the group known as the Christian left, which is what I write about in my book, the Christian left look a lot more like the Nazified German church. And I'm not trying to use this moniker and say that people are Nazis, I, I, that, that, that's overdone. But I want people to see the trend of what happens here, because this is what it leads to. Before we go any further, let's define the term Christian left. What does it mean? So the Christian left are, are essentially a growing constituency of left-leaning Christians, and at times, many times, Christians in name only, who have oftentimes a diminished view of the Bible, a downgraded view of the Bible. They no longer see it as the authoritative, you know, uh, uh, inerrant word of God. They view it as something less than that. And they've adopted many of the uh, talking points and, and uh, uh, agenda items of the left, typically around gender, sexuality. Um, I oftentimes say that uh, for the Christian left, their, their sanctuary is the environment their method of worship is sexuality and their God is the state. Uh, we see those themes. There's a spectrum here. There's some people that are, are, are I'm not going to question their salvation, but they've just adopted some socialist principles within their Christian faith. Uh, we see that in liberation theology. The current Pope is a liberation theologian. Uh, we see that within black liberation theology. We also um, uh, see some that have gone to major extremes where uh, they will refer to themselves as Christian agnostics, where they identify as a Christian, but they hold all these agnostic views. They don't really trust the reliability of the word or even necessarily the supremacy of, the, of Jesus Christ as Lord. And, but they like the teachings of Jesus. They've accepted a Jesus who is a great social organizer, and, but rather than the savior of the world. And they, it's exactly what happened really in Nazi Germany, where Hitler uh, uh, got behind the ideas and the teachings of Jesus as a as a man of the state, as a champion for the people. But but he rejected all aspects of Jesus as Lord, forgiveness of sins, you know, heaven and hell, these sorts of things. We're seeing very similar doctrines come out of the Christian left right now, uh, which is frightening. And and so that's the group that I'm referring to. Uh, it's the group of Christians who are holding uh, uh, you know, the extreme cases are holding, uh, um, uh, you know, basically uh, they're bringing in, you know, uh, uh, transgender uh, um, cross-dressers into church services and doing all sorts of parades and these sorts of things. And that's happening. It's happened in churches in Florida and New York and in Wisconsin and other places. Um, it's also the churches that are that are putting, you know, uh, homosexual clergy in place. Um, and and I, I have a pretty wide view of orthodoxy. I think that, you know, you can. I don't think it's just my denominational belief or my specific set of doctrines is what makes somebody saved. I think that, you know, uh, uh, we can have some differences over secondary issues within Christianity uh, that could look like view of, of spiritual gifts, women in ministry, uh, uh, you know, uh, view of tithing, view of, of once saved, always saved versus you can lose your salvation. We can debate these things as Christians. But when you start basically denying Jesus is Lord, the virgin birth, the miraculous power uh, of God, uh, the the creation, God is creator, um, the inerrancy of the word, the Trinity, these sorts of things. That takes you into a, into a realm that's no longer considered Christian. It doesn't matter what moniker you use. Those a belief that has that distance itself from those ideas is no longer a Christian faith, even though they're still utilizing and hijacking that term. And they're really using Jesus as a propaganda a uh, uh, individual or or front man for promoting a socialist state, and that's why this is so dangerous and so deceptive. So, do you have the statistics on how many evangelical Christians, or what is the percentage of evangelical Christians that follow the liberal school of thought? So, um, uh, I mean, certainly we're seeing better pictures of that. I mean, there was uh, some studies that were done recently by uh, uh, Barna. Uh, with the uh, uh, Cultural um, Christian Center at, at Arizona uh, University, Arizona Christian University, and and uh, they they found, and this is off the top of my head, it might not be uh, uh, um, you know 100 percent on this, but it, it's I recall that it's only about 24 percent of Christians that attend church regularly still believe that the Bible is the inerrant, authoritative Word of God. So about 76 percent of the church 
believe the Bible is something less than God breathed. First time ever in history we've been at that level. It's something like 37% of pastors is all that's left of pastors who teach a Christian worldview in America. Fortunately, other nations haven't been affected by this as maybe as readily or as quickly as America has. Uh, Certainly, Europe has had this issue for a while. You know, a lot of developing nations, Latin America, throughout Africa, they're still living off of the impact of missionaries, you know, from 18 and 1900s. and, And their churches have not been infected, you know, as much by this. Although I'm sure as global Marxism continues, they're going to be affected more and more. We, we need to do what we can to really, you know, preserve our core here in America for a biblical worldview and also around the, uh, around the world. The numbers you mentioned are pretty significant, but the question is this. I personally have friends that perhaps became Christians fairly recently. Prior to that, they were brought up or trained in college or in school or in their families on a political liberalism, but now they bring that into their newly found relationship with God. So we have to be very careful not to alienate people who belong in the church, but uh, perhaps are not yet very advanced in their knowledge of the Word of God, yet have strong political convictions that they brought with them into their newly found relationship with Christ. So how do we handle this? So I, I think that's a great question, and I think it's very easy for our pursuit for maybe restoring biblical values in our nation, and and, and specifically even just in the church, if we talk about that right now. Um, and and for the most part, I expect people who don't know Jesus to not have biblical, you know, to not have a biblical worldview. You know, it, it would be foolish to think that everybody who doesn't know Jesus is going to just somehow magically going to still have a biblical worldview. Um, of course they're not, and otherwise they'd be Christians, and so. Um, you know, we, we give, we, we, we reach out to people who are lost with love, compassion. Uh, we minister to them where they're at. I don't, uh, uh, you know, I, I had somebody post on one of my social media platforms here recently. I, I was addressing a specific topic and they said, why do you, why do you care what anybody else is doing? Why are you trying to change people? Well, I care about people's eternity. That, that certainly drives a lot of what I do, but I'm not trying to just change people who don't know the Lord. If, if I want to present Christ to them if they don't want to receive that. I, I believe in giving people the dignity to make their own choice. I believe that God gave us free will. So I'm going to, I'm not going to rob somebody else from that myself. Um, I think that that what is concerning is when we start seeing the church teach things about God that aren't true or represent God in a false way, that does become my business because as a minister of reconciliation, I want to make sure that the truth is out there. And, and, and so we have to, you know, really cast down these views that are maybe contrary to the word of God, who are spoken by people who are presenting themselves as teachers of the word. There's a difference between somebody teaching the gospel with false motives and somebody teaching a false gospel. So the one we're encouraged in scripture just to let them go and not to judge their motives, just to, you know, it's God's going to work that out in the end. The other we're encouraged to rebuke and to restore as best we can. And so I think that, you know, a big part of this to prevent this from becoming so emotional and name calling, I'm not recommending we just start going out and going, you Marxist, you Nazi, you know, that that doesn't that doesn't get us anywhere. What we do is we take people who are willing to listen and we try to educate them on these issues. We educate them on the history of critical race theory. We educate them on the issue on the issue of progressive ideology, where the the, where the uh, where did Christianity begin viewing Jesus you know, through the socialist lens, we take them back to the 17, 1800s with the teachings of the historical Jesus movement and other progressive theological, you know, uh, uh, viewpoints. Um, and so we, we train them in these things. We get them, you know, we get their eyes open with this. We pull back the scales, you know, that have formed. Uh, there's going to be some people that's harder than others. And we encourage them to, we also simultaneously, we train them in the word. You know, we, we encourage them to develop their life as a, as a Bible first mentality, meaning, that they don't allow their politics to shape their faith. They allow their, sh- their their faith to shape their politics, and they start there. And so good discipleship prevents a lot of this, and it remedies a lot of this. But the church has to be committed to it, and the church has to agree to speak out. And that means that pastors have to be willing to speak out about these issues, which seems to be where a lot of the problem is, because these pastors are trained in liberal institutions or liberal Bible colleges, and then they're coming into their church. They don't themselves share a lot of convictions over these issues. And so oftentimes that that sort of oozes out into the pews with the parishioners that are there. 
And then you have a church that is, you know, basically drifting further and further left. So there's a lot at stake. I'm an optimist, though. I believe undoubtedly that God wins at the end. Uh, and that I'm excited to wake up every day and to share these things with people and to the stories that we see. And I was once really lured by Christian socialism in my early uh, uh, time in ministry. I was fascinated with it. And uh, I thought it was I thought it was, you know, symbiotic. And and what I found is that socialism and Marxism are completely antithetical to the gospel. Uh, that that was not a belief that I once held. But as I studied it more and more and saw that socialism is responsible for over 100 million deaths in the last 100 years, it was pretty easy to start coming to terms with the fact that this is not a biblical construct. And we have to, first and foremost, go to scripture to build our worldview. My last question is, what advice can you give our listeners? How do we address this problem without allowing the church to become a pawn in the political process? Because it seems like this is what the church has become lately. Yeah. So uh, let me just say this. There's a lot of issues within the Republican Party and even within the conservative movement uh, when it comes to a Christian faith perspective. I believe that there is a way to live out biblical values, which oftentimes align with conservative values in most cases, uh, not in every case, but in most cases, it's possible to align yourself with biblical values and to be a strong, bold, freedom uh, warrior in this country to, to stand against a, you know, a, a Marxist uh, a regime, and whether that be in corporate America or within, you know, government. Uh, in, in a way that is still, uh, um, you know, well within our rights as people you know, uh, that are governed by a constitution here in America. Um, and I think that we can do that. I'm not promoting weak Christians. I'm also not promoting, uh, um, you know, Christians who are, are uh, so hate filled and so bent on, you know, uh, in the name of protecting the country that they lose all sight of Christian love. That's that's deception as well. So. What I'm saying, I think, is unique compared to what, what a lot of people are hearing that's out there. And I see too many conservatives that are comfortable. Uh, and look, I'm not a prude. I, I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, you know, I, I don't come from a holiness movement. I believe that we're saved by grace through faith. Uh, I, I think that, that we have all sorts of, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, liberality within uh, the Christian faith and, and as believers in Christ. But I think that there is a there's a lot of moral depravity that exists on the right as well. And it's being done in the name of conservatism. That makes me nervous. And so, you know, I, I wrote the book, The Christian Left. Who knows? In five years, if the problem flip flops, I'll write the book, The Christian Right. I'm not opposed to doing that. I'll call I'll call error out where error is. But what I'm seeing right now, there's way more problems on the left. And there is there's no there's no way a Christian can align themselves with the Democratic Party platform. And we, we don't really have any true Democrats in the country anymore. They're just leftists in disguise. And most true Democrats have been ran out of the party a long time ago or they've been silenced. It's very hard to align yourself with a leftist agenda and still be a Christian. You you certainly can't do it and be a disciple. I'm not going to question one's salvation, but you can't do it and be a disciple. Uh, you can align yourself with a conservative agenda and be a disciple. You just have to be careful because there's snakes in that realm, too. And so we have to avoid that. And so um, we have to, you know, uh, really hold people to standards. We have to use our vote. We have to use our voice. We have to uh, we have to, you know, be be a light in this world. Um, I provide some questions in the back of my book, The Christian Left, where uh, questions you can ask your pastor to make sure that you're not in a church that's drifting towards leftist ideology. And also that you can ask yourself, you know, along the way and some action steps that you can get involved. I support Christians being involved in their local uh, uh, politics. I'd love to see everybody at a local GOP be meeting be a uh, hardcore Christian and that that's driving what they're doing first and foremost, even before their politics. I think the world would be a lot better place if there were more Christians in politics. And so I certainly encourage that. Thank you, Lucas, for the very interesting interview. We're going to post the links to your book and to your website in the show notes so that our listeners can check it out for themselves. Awesome. I, you're a great host and you ask some really, uh, uh, really thought-provoking questions. So appreciate the time with you. I think one of the most important things that Lucas said in our conversation is that our faith must influence our politics instead of politics influencing our faith. 
While it is wise for the church to protect our freedom, to live by the word of God, our main mission remains to make disciples of all nations, including the people in our own country. At World Missions Alliance, we believe that changed lives change lives. If your life has been changed by Christ, you have a power to impact the world. So if you would like to learn more how to get involved with World Missions Alliance, how to connect to your greater purpose, I encourage you to visit our website, rfwma.org. By the way, if you're enjoying this podcast, I encourage you to consider supporting us financially. Uh, This will help us to continue to make more episodes and reach more people with the good news of Jesus all around the world. You can do this just by visiting again our website, rfwma.org slash forward give and donate whatever God lays on your heart. I'm thankful in advance. Thank you for listening to the Limitless Spirit podcast. Until next time, I'm your host, Helen Todd. Limitless Spirit podcast is produced by World Missions Alliance. We believe that changed lives change lives. If you want to see your life transformed by Christ's love, or if you want to help those who are hurting and hopeless and discover your greater purpose in serving Christ through short-term missionary work, check out our website, rfwma.org, and find out how to get involved.